Okay, I put this thing on, enlarge the screen. Uh, I was going to wait till the libraries open and get hard copies, but they're taking their time, being convenient, and uh, waiting around for a hard copy in this day and age. This day and age seems ridiculous, so. Um, yeah, so I'm trying not to slur. I'm trying to practice my enunciation. Uh, get into back into. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I tried doing this on screen. Forget it. My eyesight is never going to be there again. Uh. Hmm. I'm looking at this. Should I? Is that? Okay, we're going to see how this goes. A Study in Scarlet by author, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Arthur Conan Doyle. All right. Chapter 1. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. In the year 1878, I took my degree of Doctor of Medicine of the University of London and proceeded to Netley to go through the course prescribed for surgeons in the army. Having completed my studies there, I was duly attached to the 5th Northumberland Fusiliers as assistant surgeon. The regiment was stationed in India at the time, and before I could join it, the Second Afghan War had broken out. On landing at Bombay, I learned that my corps had advanced through the passes and was already deep in the enemy's country. I followed, however, with many other officers who were in the same situation as myself and succeeded in reaching Kandahar in safety, where I found my regiment and at once entered upon my new duties. The campaign brought honors and promotion to many, but for me it had nothing but misfortune and disaster. I was removed from my brigade and attached to the Berkshires, with whom I served at the fatal battle of Malland. There I was struck on the shoulder by a Jazer bullet, which shattered the bone and grazed the subclavian artery. I should have fallen into the hands of the murderous Gandhi. Had it not been for the devotion and courage shown by Murray, Murray, my orderly, who threw me across the, a pack horse and succeeded in bringing me safely to the British lines. Worn with pain and weak from the prolonged hardships which I had undergone, I was removed with a great train of wounded sufferers to the base hospital at Peshawar. Here I rallied and had already improved so far as to be able to walk about the wards and even to bask a little upon the veranda when I was struck down by enteric, enteric fever, that curse of our Indian possessions. For months my life was despaired of, and when at last I came to myself and became convalescent, I was so weak and emaciated that a medical board determined that not a day should be lost in sending me back to England. I was dispatched accordingly in the troop ship Orontis and landed a month later on Portsmouth Jetty with my health irretrievably ruined, but with permission from a paternal government to spend the next nine months in attempting to improve it. I had neither kith nor kin in England, and was therefore as free as air, or as free as an income of, of eleven shillings and sixpence a day will permit a man to be. Under such circumstances I naturally gravitated to London, 
that great cesspool into which all the loungers and idlers of the empire are irresistibly drained. There I stayed for some time at a private hotel in the Strand, leading a comfortless, meaningless existence, and spending much money, and spending such money as I had considerably more freely than I ought. So alarming did the state of my finances become that I soon realized that I must either leave the metropolis and rusticate somewhere in the country, or that I must make a complete alteration in my style of living. Choosing the latter alternative, I began by making up my mind to leave the hotel and to take up my quarters in some less pretentious and less expensive domicile. On the very day that I had come to this conclusion, I was standing at the Criterion Bar when someone tapped me on the shoulder and turning round, I recognized young Stamford, who had been a dresser under me at Bart's. The sight of a friendly face in the great wilderness of London is a pleasant thing indeed to a lonely man. In old days, Stamford had never been a particular crony of mine, but now I hailed him with enthusiasm, and he, in his turn, appeared to be delighted to see me. In the exuberance of my joy, I asked him to lunch with me at the Holborn, and we started off together in a hansom. Whatever have you been doing with yourself, Watson? He asked in undisguised wonder as we rattled through the crowded London streets. You are as thin as a lath and as brown as a nut. I gave him a short sketch of my adventures and had hardly concluded it by the time, by the time that we reached our destination. Poor devil, he said, commiseratingly, after he had listened to my misfortunes. What are you up to now? Looking for lodgings, I answered, trying to solve the problem as to whether it is possible to get comfortable rooms at a reasonable price. That's a strange thing, remarked my companion. You are the second man today that you had used that expression to me. And who was the first, I asked. A fellow who is working at the chemical laboratory of the hospital. He was bemoaning himself this morning because he could not get someone to go halves with him in some nice rooms which he had found and which were too much for his purse. By Jove, I cried, if he really wants someone to share the rooms and the expense, I am the very man for him. I should prefer having a partner to being alone. Young Stanford looked rather strangely at me over his wine glass. You don't know Sherlock Holmes yet, he said. Perhaps you would not care for him as a constant companion. Why? What is there against him? Oh, I didn't say there was anything against him. He is a rather queer, he is a little queer in his ideas, an enthusiast in some branches of science. As far as I know, he is a decent fellow enough. A medical student, I suppose, said I. No, I have no idea what he intends to go in for. I believe he is well up in anatomy, and he is a first-class chemist, but as far as I know, he has never taken out any systematic medical classes. His studies are very desultory and eccentric, but he has amassed a lot of out-of-the-way knowledge which would astonish his professors. Did you never ask him what he is going in for, I asked? No, he is not a man that is easy to draw out, though he can be communicative enough when the fancy seizes him. I should like to meet him, I said. If I am to lodge with anyone, I should prefer a man of studious and quiet habits. I am not strong enough yet to stand much noise or excitement. I had, I had enough of both in Afghanistan to last for the remainder of my natural existence. How could I meet this friend of yours? He is sure to be at the laboratory, returned my companion. He either avoids the place for weeks, or else he works there from morning to night. If you like, we shall drive round together after luncheon. Certainly, I answered, and the conversation drifted away into other channels. As we made our way to the hospital after leaving the Holborn, 
Stanford gave me a few more particulars about the gentleman whom I proposed to take as a fellow lodger. You mustn't blame me if you don't get on with him, he said. I know nothing more of him than I have learned from meeting him occasionally in the laboratory. You proposed this arrangement, so you must not hold me responsible. If we don't get on, it will be easy to part company, I answered. It seems to me, Stamford, I added, looking hard at my companion, that you have some reason for washing your hands of the matter. Is this fellow's temper so formidable, or what is it? Don't be mealy-mouthed about it. It is not easy to express the inexpressible, he answered with a laugh. Holmes is a little too scientific for my tastes. It approaches to cold bloodiness. I could imagine his giving a friend a little pinch of the latest vegetable alkaloid, not out of malevolence, you understand, but simply out of a spirit of inquiry in order to have an accurate idea of the effects. To do him justice, I think that he would take it himself with the same readiness. He appears to have a passion for definite and exact knowledge. Very right, too. Yes, but it may be pushed to excess. When it comes to beating the subjects in the dissecting rooms with a stick, it is certainly taking rather a bizarre shape. Beating the subjects? Yes to verify how far bruises may be produced after death. I saw him at it with my own eyes. And yet you say he is not a medical student. No. Heaven knows what the objects of his studies are. But here, we're, but here we are, and you must form your own impressions about him. As he spoke, we turned down a narrow lane and passed through a small side door, which opened into a wing of the great hospital. It was familiar ground to me, and I needed no guiding as we ascended the bleak stone staircase and made our way down the long corridor with its vista of whitewashed wall and dun-colored doors. Near the further end, a low arched passage branched away from it and led to the chemical laboratory. I'll stop there. There are plenty of uh, words I have to look up. Not uh, necessarily for its definition, but for the pronunciation. I could cheat and just download the audio, which is what I'll end up doing. Yes, yeah, I'm lazy like that. Okay. Either way, names and objects that no longer exist or are no longer in common use, you tend to have to do stuff like that. Uh, which is why Shakespeare is always a handful. Unless you're studying it in school and they go over all the details to break it down for you. So you can be lazy and just well, kind of being lazy. Do the uh, the assignments, uh, do the homework, and uh, they, they tend to do a good job covering all those tidbits. Yeah, if you're reading on your own, you've got to do it yourself. So, yeah. Um, if any other issues come up, if it's so completely out of your... Um, personal experience, you may find it helpful to uh, watch a movie, and then it's a very famous book, there's probably a movie about the book itself, and you don't just have to settle for uh, a movie in the same era, time frame, whatever. So that's another advantage of uh, sticking to the classics. Chances are, not only can you download the audio version for free, that's always very important, but you can also probably hoopla your way to uh, more um, 
more information, more background information by watching uh, the movie version. Just because you want to be educated doesn't mean you're not lazy. I mean, let's be real. Who the hell wants to work that hard? And I'll tell you, I'll answer you, no one. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, you get these strange characters that just are driven to not only go the extra mile, but go the extra hundred miles just to satisfy their ego and their need for supposed uh, superiority. I mean, it's easier to, to work yourself into that kind of frenzy when you're a kid than when you're an adult, because... Well, let's face it, kids are placed in circumstances that are often beyond their control. If you're adult and have done this, uh, something's wrong. So anyway, yeah. By all means, go the extra mile, but... Uh, I mean, if you got to go beyond that, uh, I think your priorities need readjusting. All right. So, uh, yeah, nowadays it's just ridiculous to actually wait until the library. Uh, I mean, it's nice having a hard copy, but uh, you should nowadays you shouldn't be restricted to that. You can't always get a hold of it, but this. You can almost always manage. And again, that's the advantage of picking classics. Not only can you download the audio version of it to get your little background information, but you can probably Google the movie, some kind of movie version of it. So, yeah. You can be lazy. Don't worry. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. This still takes a little bit of effort. But it certainly beats having to. I don't know. If you're not making money out of it. I mean, to make an animated. Uh. video. It might be nice if you're a real enthusiast and really have the extra time and just to do it once or twice to see what's involved if you're really curious about it. But I mean, if you're not making money out of it, it seems kind of ridiculous. Now that's having a lot of time on your hands. And uh, considering the circumstances nowadays, I think they really need to adjust your Unless you've already, you were into that when you were a kid, so you already have all the skills and maybe you need a little updating as far as some of the uh, advances in software are concerned. But, I mean, if you're starting from scratch, I, well, I don't know. I, I shouldn't criticize, but I mean, that's... Look around you, maybe you, you should be doing something else. All right, anyway, and so we begin. What is that going to be? Story time with Auntie D? Okay, so I guess the next thing is to download the audio and highlight the, uh, the, the words that needed uh, fixing. I know I wasn't even close. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you you know you read it uh, two or three times to really focus pinpoint the the phrases that you need to look up. But uh, even so, I mean it's like you're doing this thing in Spanish. Don't go for Don Quixote. <laughs> oh, that's a kid's mistake. You know, go for for, for uh, the first Harry Potter or something. That way, uh, 
you know, if you need to work on your your Spanish or something, at least you're learning current language usage and current vocabulary. Otherwise, it's like trying to get through Shakespeare. What? Oh, if you're a native speaker, I guess you already know all that kind of stuff, so your own preferences. Knock yourself out. And someone that's trying to learn languages and whatnot, you get one thing bleeding into another, one pastime bleeding into another one. So, yeah, if you, if you also start doing stuff like that, you want to start reading in your target language after you, you know, gone a little beyond intermediate level. For God's sakes, don't torture yourself. Pick a, pick a book that's, you know, pick a, something that's a favorite with you and, and isn't 400 years old. So, Killing two birds with one stone. Right? You're working on something you know you find enjoyable. Because if you're working through it just to be end up being disappointed or depressed, I mean, what the heck? That's a lot of work. So something you know you're gonna like, the, you like the whole darn thing. No nasty surprises in that respect. And uh, current. Killing two birds with one stone, so you're actually working on your language skills, usable language skills. And the, the first Harry Potter, because it's it doesn't get uh, too complicated. If you can amuse yourself with children's books, that would even be better, more than likely, than if you're a little harder to uh, stay amused. Yeah. Um, I just find it an easy, uh, an easy choice for uh, expanding foreign language skills. All right, choose whatever works for you. Obviously, whatever you enjoy, because staying motivated is the number one issue in studying studying languages. No one's going to do the work for you. Whatever else, whatever method you use, you, it comes down to you doing the work and being consistent about it. You know, at least three times a week. Well, four is better, but at least three times a week. So stuff like that. Staying motivated, number one. And uh, keeping it simple but effective. So don't get fancy, you know. Don't uh, bust your chops over things that really. It may satisfy some little uh, ego trip, but it's really not applicable unless your language skills have gotten so advanced that. You can afford to do that. Uh, don't be a smart aleck, you know. Get get the basics covered before going for your little specialties. It's a lot of work, no matter what. So you know, might as well have it pay off for you. But of course, once you're in, gone. Gone beyond being advanced, that's your own business. You, you, you can play with it like that. But until then, go. Yeah, don't be too silly. Okay, that's it. Take care. Auntie D signing off.